Cherish. I, I was building chatbots between 2006 and roughly 2012, 2013. So basically, um, after and before everybody cared about. So basically, in a time spirit or, or time frame where nobody mm -hmm. liked it and nobody saw any potential in it, and everybody said that's crazy. So why would anyone would want to talk to a computer in a natural language? That's insane, and this is really crazy. So yeah. Um, I'm going to talk basically about, first of all, uh, we built a framework back in the days. It's more kind of a development over six mm -hmm. years where we um, made a lot of, um, a lot of uh, learnings and a lot of things. Um, I'm going to present the workflow at the beginning, what we did and how mm -hmm. this all works. It's not really about tech, so I'll leave all the tech stuff aside. I'm just basically how it works and, and how we conquer different type of chatbots. We were building chatbots for e-commerce, for first level support, education, and this is a workflow that might be not the best, but at least it works for various use cases. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to give you the stage then. Enjoy. And we're Thank curious what you've got to share. Great. Um, yeah, to make it fun or more interesting in the beginning, uh, we had some promotion video back in the days, uh, a couple of years ago. So I'm going to start with the promotion video. Uh, the company back in the days was called Spoken Language System, so don't get it, uh, don't get it mixed up. Now, nowadays, basically, Eddie, that's, that's the framework itself. company doesn't exist anymore. Um, yeah, have a look, and then we talk about the framework and afterwards some learnings that we had over the years. Hi, Eddie. Can you help me out? I just broke my smartphone and I need a new one. Thank you for the information. I can suggest the following five smartphones. They all fulfill your requirements. I hope one of the phones fits your needs. Yes, it's a great selection. Thank you, Eddie. Eddie, Enhanced Dialogue Driven Intelligence is a new platform where you can easily create and maintain your virtual personal assistant. They speak and interact like humans and are available 24-7 in order to take care of your customers' needs. Whether you would like to apply it to your first-level support, consulting, or educational purposes, Eddie can be taught and learn any kind of knowledge. If you have any other desires, please let me know. Actually, there is something. Sure. How can I help? I'm looking for a nice girl who's intelligent, kind, and sweet. Something like that? So that's just a little video from back in the days. Um, obviously a promotion video, but um, yeah, companies nowadays offer pretty much the same, so the use case hasn't changed much. Um, obviously, conversation hasn't changed much, and use cases as well. So, Eddie. Um, Eddie is basically a platform that we developed um, where you can create and maintain and obviously run chatbots. Um, maintaining chatbots is a very big topic. I mean, nowadays everybody builds the first chatbots and don't think about maintaining, and why would you name, maintain anything in chatbots? But this is actually a big topic, and it's really frustrating if you build more than one chatbot, and um, this is something I'm going to talk about a, a little bit further. So Eddie is basically not a cloud service or anything similar to API AI or WIT AI. It's basically two servers you can run on your own hardware, on premise, on your, um, and connect it to your own to, to your own services. That's basically the main idea. So we have two servers. One is basically configuring. You have a UI. You have the monitoring. Um, you have automated tested testing. That's very important. It's sort of integration testing because. Sooner or later, when you build a bot, you will figure out you have a couple of functions, you build more functions, and suddenly some functions break. And you never recognize it because you just don't always try everything. So um, there is a real need for, for a certain kind of testing that goes beyond that, that little testing of just functionality, but the overall testing of user experience, which is very, very important if you want to build quality with your chatbots. Um, and there's a second server that's basically um, you configure it first, that's really stupid, that just holds all the data and the configurations, and the other server um, basically, based on those con configurations, um, has the chatbot, and that's the core server is basically the unit that talks to the, to the people. Um, so the difference, or, or maybe the, the unique point compared to all those thousand other stuffs that's out, out there, um, First of all, it, it's really made with the idea in mind that you can connect it to any other system. And what I mean by that is not just a click, 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 and then you have it. But I mean, we usually you will have to have a developer that codes a little bit. You have an API, you have a database, 
you, you will need to have a developer. But you don't want to take care about everything. You have conversation workflow, you have certain different algorithms, parsing, meaning extraction, stuff like that. So ideally you have a system that takes care about everything you don't want to take care about and just implement the stuff you need and have a ready to go chatbot. Um, reusability is something at the beginning, if you build one chatbot, it doesn't matter. But if you build a second, a third, a fourth, you figure out, hey, there is a lot of stuff different, but a lot of stuff is actually, you could just take from the other, and people would start copy-basting to the second chatbot, and so on and so forth. But for instance, when people greet, uh, they say hello, they say hi, they say, in German, they would say servus, but there is a limited amount of ways somebody could greet the chatbot. So that is basically a dictionary you build once and reuse it for later purposes without this classical copy-pasting. A lot of people do these days. Um, and scalability. I mean, nowadays, actually, every, every system should scale, so meaning reaching a lot of, uh, like, millions of users without system breaking down. Um, but actually, it's, it's quite tough to build a chatbot system that can handle a lot of users. That is mainly due to various algorithms that take a lot of um, calculation capacity. And you really have to be smart about how to arrange those algorithms to not um, yeah, either let the system break down or maybe have users waiting for the answers minutes. Uh, this is, you really want to have fast answers. Um, technology stack, um, we used Java back in the days. It's a very performant uh, web server. It's Dockerized. Um, Dockerized, uh, just shortly, is, 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 a, is a technology that allows basically to let it run on almost any cloud service or own service without the hustle. Uh, REST for microservices is basically yeah, an architecture that allows to scale very well and no SQL database, I think most of people should have heard about that. So the very basic workflow, I mean there, there could be a lot of additions to it, further plugins make it complicated, but to keep it very simple, there is a chatbot and there are knowledge packages and that could be, imagine like a smartphone having apps, basically. And what it is, and any any chatbot system I've seen so far parses input, extracts meaning, makes decisions about the meaning, and then gives some sort of feedback to the user. This is really the basic routine. I haven't seen any chatbot that works differently. Um, so how could it work? First, you have a parser that kind of translates. You have a lot of words that sometimes mean the very same thing. That could be a synonym. That could be a weird translation about, yeah, I need a smartphone to call my mother and blah, blah, blah. And kind of, you know, semantic meaning behind it. Yeah? But in the end, whatever the user says, if you know the meaning, you just want to know, okay, this is about this, this, this. Sort of keyword matching, phrase matching, context matching. So um, this is the very first part, usually the hardest part, because if you suck at that part and you don't understand the user, you're gone. You, you have no chance. I mean, you can ask the user, hey, please reformulate your questions or give another, give, give another question to him. But if you have no idea what the user wants, um, yeah, everything after it, you are lost. So uh, input path has to be really strong. And my personal opinion is configuration matters here most. Um, we tried. I would say roughly 20 to 30 different correction algorithms. Okay, maybe, maybe I want to explain this shortly. Um, usually you have a set of words or phrases in a database that you expect the user to say, and based on that you do something. But I would say 90% of the cases, people type it in slightly different. Might that be a different grammar, typos, whatever. So you can bet whatever you want to type in, it's not what, uh, it's not what you have in the database. So you need some sort of algorithms who can check, okay, was that the word I was looking for? Maybe it was a typo or a different grammatical order or something like that. But it really depends where this is coming from. If it's, if it's like somebody who originally talked to a speech recognition software, like in the way I talk right now, and it gets translated to text, you have to use completely different algorithms versus somebody typing on the keyboard. For instance, when I say something, a word, and it might be that, that the computer translates it different, but then I'm, I'm, going, I'm looking for the phonetic. I'm going to look for maybe there are other words that pronounce similar, but just written completely different. But when it's on the keyboard, when I know he typed something in, then it might be more interesting to look what other, what other um, letters are around that word, and maybe he just typed. Uh, and, and one way or the other, it really matters where is the initial input coming from, and therefore I would use one algorithm over the other. 
um, really depends on the use case. So, um, okay, we said, let's say we, we, we conquer that, we are good to go, we know what the user wants, usually people call that intent, a user has an intent, or maybe just want to say something, so then you have to make a decision what to do next. So, um, what we're going to see later, there are possibilities to look into databases in between to make assumptions um, about what he what he wants or or what would be the best way to answer. Uh, but usually, you have some sort of dialogue behavior, dialogue rules. Um, some do it structure it as a tree where it's very strict. Once you go in one way, you have to answer those questions from the chatbot. Um, my personal learning is give users the freedom. I mean, it's really tough to make that happen, that you're really good at it and still understanding everything, even if the user doesn't answer your question. Um, but it doesn't feel natural anymore if you force people to, to answer your question. I mean, this is, if, if a human being asks a question and you don't get an answer, you, you wouldn't repeat that question over and over again until he get, gives you the answer. So that's, that's just very important to keep that flexibility, uh, to make it more natural and realistic. Um, yeah, and, and, and rules per se should have conditions. Basically, any kind of condition. That could be what did the user say, other rules that might apply, but also, is it raining outside? Uh, or we, we heard before um, about the Austrian Airlines chat, but could be, um, is, is, there, is there cancellation or is, is, is it fully booked or whatever? I mean, it's not always. I, see, I, heard, I hear a lot of people talking about event driven is the most important thing. Whatever the user wants, this is, this is everything. But I mean, let's consider, okay, let's consider a fun effect. Imagine you would tell Siri or any other chatbot to text your ex-girlfriend on Saturday, 5 o'clock in the morning, rather than on a, mo on a Monday afternoon. The intent would be the very much the same, but actually on a Saturday morning at 5 o'clock, you would probably consider to tell the user, this is, might be not a good idea, you should reconsider and do that after the weekend, right? Rather compared to a weekday where you say, okay, maybe there's something to discuss about. So. Um, yeah, we knew the intent, what you wanted to do, and we could execute it, but based on very other factors, in that case time, weekday or whatever, we would have made a completely different decision on how to go. And this is just something I want to give to you guys. Um, don't always go for what the user says, because sometimes they just don't know what they want, and sometimes what they want is really not what they should get. Um, yeah, rules should trigger actions, some sort. This is very abstract. Usually it's kind of very simple. User says hello, the rule says if the user says hello, greet him back. That would be very simple. But it could, actions could be any other thing. Could be uh, integration to a house, switch on the light, switch it off, send me an email, whatever. So actions could be any kind of action you can think of. Very simplest one would be the output. So yeah, this is the very simple one. Um, we started in 2006, and back in the days, um, we, we used a programming language called Prolog, which is short for programming logic. Um, it was already dead by the time, so that uh, language, but um, sort of we felt, okay, this, this must be the language to go, and this will help us a lot. And actually, it did help us a lot because it brought us a lot of idea on, on, on how to analyze language, break it down sentence-wise. Uh, finally, after a couple of years, we figured out, okay, this is performance-wise really better idea to go with Prolog, so we implemented everything in Java. But, but again, um, I, I liked it very much because the approach of Pro Prolog is kind of logical matching of, of different possibilities, um, and that's helped us um, greatly um, sharpen the workflow we have at the moment. So yeah, it would be greeting. The, the input parser would say, okay, so it's, it's a type of greeting, uh, could be... Maybe we could arrange if it's hello or hi, we react differently. In that case, we say any type of greeting, just greet the user back and say, hello, how are you? So that would be the, the most simplest workflow you could have in order to, to give an, an answer to a question or an output to an input. A little bit more complex since a new uh, Austrian Airlines bot was presented before. I thought, okay, let's, let's have that as an example. So imagine you are checking in um, and you want to use your chatbot. So, um, I mean, obviously, you can always tell what you want, but very often we as users or human beings know what we don't want. Um, or maybe describe it in a weird way because this is the way we're thinking and we're just, we're just letting our mind go. And then usually you have some, in reality, some sales advisors or support advisors who kind of translate your weirdness into reality and then get you what you want. So um, in this case, um, 
person doesn't doesn't say what you where you want to sit, but he definitely knows where he don't want to sit. The worst thing you can do is make him make him make him seated exactly in that area where he don't want to sit. So, um, but I mean, I tested a couple of chatbots. None of them are capable to do a simple uh, negation. Uh, so if you say I don't want this, most likely you get exactly this uh, because they ignore not, they ignore or, they ignore and. Really basic communications is it's right now. I would say 80% of all chatbots are just keyword search that's happening in a messenger. So, um, yeah. I think chatbots start where you have a real conversation when you can refer to stuff you have said before. If you can't, then it's not a chatbot. I'm sorry if I insult anyone, but this is really the case, at least my personal opinion. So, um, if you extract meaning out of there, and that would be in that case, okay, I want to sit anywhere, but definitely not the corridor. Um, you need to make sure that you figure out if that is possible. And there is, there is the things where there are external APIs come into play. So basically, you would want to implement some sort of API, either be that your own system or some external system, whatever. You don't know at the beginning, so there is no just plug and play system, but you want to have it make it easy. And expressions as they are, um, you can transform them in a way so that you get search queries out of it. So whatever, and that could be, it's just a simple a simple way of, of having an input parsed, but that could be over the whole conversation, um, extracting a search query that is logical correct to what the user said. Um, and if you can do that, then you can be really accurate. Um, and then you, then you have the search results, and based on that, you can tell the user if it's possible or not. And here again, uh, there is a certain intent, but what is way more important, what the database says in that case. Because if there is no seed available, it wouldn't make sense to offer him any seed. So here again, actually, database uh, rules over the input of the user. Um, after external search, we have again, we have to make a decision what we're going to do. Are there seeds available? If yes, we can confirm it. If not, then not. And we go back to the output. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You you would optimize that. You would optimize it, obviously. Um, we, yeah, 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 I know. I mean, okay, fair enough. AD doesn't do anything of that because I don't see that as as the domain of being a yeah. chatbot. For I mean, if I have a search query, then the database should take care about it. This is my personal approach, and if it's if it's their read on that questions or answers or whatever in there, um, there probably would be some other API in the middle just make it more simple and more performant. Um, for me, there's really what it, this is the for for me this is the maximum a chatbot can do. Uh, really translate some search uh, or extract some some type of search query. But apart from that, I would really say everything else should should be done by the API. Okay. Reusability. Um, I mean, you can always build modules and you can always copy paste, but um, you really want to make sure quality fits, especially when it comes to chatbots. I mean, you have an app and you have software, and people are used that software doesn't work. But if you talk in your natural language, you you have to keep in mind people. No, people are used to talk to people, so there is there is no expectation of bugs or, or, or misconfigurations, uh, at least not by heart. I mean, they know they're talking to a computer, but if they if they don't have that in if they don't have this in conscious and and just type and, and want to chat, um, the it's it's, re it's really you you got to make sure the quality fits, and therefore if you reuse stuff, you should make sure that you don't break other stuff, especially if you have more chatbots and reuse stuff and maybe alter some things with the second chatbot. Uh, you want to make sure the first chatbot, uh, chatbot still works fine. So that's why we integrated. I mean, this is really uh, after four or five years, we came to that idea that it's very important that you have data uh, databases like uh, dictionaries and all that stuff. You should version it and really make sure um, you always know exactly what your bot is capable of doing rather than let the magic happen. Um, it's really similar to version control systems, so each of you who knows software development is pretty much that. 
Um, the, the idea and the way it works is the same. It's just built into the chatbot system on the chatbot configuration itself and not on a deeper technical level. And yeah, it's really with the third chatbot, if you just build one chatbot, it doesn't matter, really, forget it. But if you build more and you want to reuse stuff and you have built some sort of parts you're really proud about, you want to reuse this but not copy paste it for obvious reason, then I think versioning and reusing that way is a very smart choice. Um, so talking about plugins, um, in the beginning we, we wanted to build something that works everywhere all the time with a simple click. I mean that was the vision and obviously it failed. Um, we actually failed completely in the beginning. We had to build, some people would call it clue code chatbots just to make it somehow work so that it appears to be somehow smart and after the fourth or fifth chatbot we figured out okay there are some things that are the same and other stuff is not the same and Ooh, this is difficult. I mean, how you want to build a chatbot system that can, can deal with anything, but on the other end, it's easy enough to, to deal with. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just as simple as that. You build plugins, or you have a bunch of plugins available that you can just rearrange. If you have a certain use case, you just use that one plugin that fits that, that part very well. Um, in that case, there is a life cycle that is basically what we saw before, is the parser, dialogue rules, output, external database searches or whatever, you name it. Um, and if you have your own API call or your own algorithm or want to just do it yourself, you just uh, write a, a quick plugin for it, plug it in and you have your own use case and not the hustle of anything else. And that's, that is something I would say distinct from a lot of other systems where you just have to deal with what they offer and if they don't offer it, then good luck. Um, but this is not flexible enough because um, you might don't want to build your own parser, but you might have a situation where the parser does, this, does something that is not in your intention. It's just one very use case. And I'm, I'm sure everybody who has built a chatbot, chatbot they, they, you guys use various systems and you come to a point where that system offers a certain solution you're just not comfortable with. And you want to change only that and not the whole system. So what are you going to do about it? And there is the point where you have to, to be able to alter um, plugins or algorithms only slightly so that you get that little bit of change to solve that certain kind of problem. Um, very complex because sometimes if you, you know, rearrange everything then nothing works anymore. Um, but in that case if you really have extension points that really plugs into to the lowest level, like that be dictionaries or correction algorithms, you can rearrange them based on stuff. Um, you really have the, the powerfulness of, of making a good chatbot that has a certain quality. Um, again, dialogue rules, we said it about conditions before. Um, it's very important that you have the possibility to connect it to whatever, either be a weather channel, either be your own API, um, a schedule of a train. It, it would be so easy if you just have a condition, is the train on time, yes or no, and that might be some, some sort of action that, that gets triggered. Output, um, we tried in the back in the days uh, some sort of scrambling around, scrambling together some sentences based on very sophisticated algorithm. But it turned out there is there are not so many possibilities on how to answer in a certain case. If you have one case, there might be three, four ways you can formulate it, that's it. So why using that amazing algorithm if you just can type in him and you're there and have four sentences available and templated. So um, we throw it all away and said okay this is way easier just to prepare stuff and give you some sort of random factor so that it appears smart and yeah works perfectly. So yeah just an overview all those gray areas are basically extension points where you can plug in your own thing if you're not satisfied with how it works at the moment or um, what can be done at the moment. Um, so therefore, it, it really deals with a lot of use cases you can imagine of. Um, I haven't seen a lot that, that it doesn't deal with. I mean, obviously, APIs you have to implement yourself, but when it comes to the, um, parsing of meaning and dialogue behavior and stuff like that, it, it really has a lot, um, but it's always easy to extend it in one way or the other. A um, little bit more, then we get away from the technical stuff, interesting to the lessons learned. Um, just the two type of plugins. I mean, uh, people sometimes get scared and say, Java, why? I'm no chess developer or whatever, and I don't like the technology, and that's not, I'm not going to use it. But seriously, I mean, you can use Java plugins, but nowadays it's easy to connect it over network stacks and therefore use whatever technology you want. I mean, these days, really, I think there should be no, the, not the preference for one technology for all, but use the technology that suits you best and just connect it to the system. 
um, default setup on how we have run it on our own storages and, and, and cloud uh, services, that's the way I would suggest it. Always use Docker. Um, I would personally never recommend anymore just running a plain server on any server unless you have a really, really good reason. But nowadays, Docker is the way to go. Uh, we use a single sign-on service just to take care about all those permission handlings, about the different configuration. You could share configurations with others and stuff like that. Um, so this is a pretty decent setup. So let's get away from the technical part, more to the learnings. Um, we wanted to build a nice chatbot that is basically um, awesome uh, and knows everything. But turns out this doesn't work at all. So um, the, the, the biggest problem here is the complexity raises the more functionality it has. And you easily break, break stuff if you have a lot of features. So um, really. The suggestion here is don't go for one bot, go for many bots. I mean, you, you have if you have a service, if you're running a service, you don't have one guy sitting there knows it all. You have a lot of people, and sometimes even different competences. So I would do the very same thing with a chatbot. Just give them little functionality, tell the user what to expect, a little bit, you know, keep the expectations low is always the good thing. Then people get excited. It's better than the other way around. And just have a lot of them. And maybe even let them know about each other. Huh? If somebody comes with a question and this is not the chatbot who can answer it, hey, my colleague can do that. I will transfer you to them. That would be a very smart. And this is really less work. And I wouldn't go for one chatbot that knows it all. It's just way too much work and costs too much. Three more, two more. Okay. Um, Three or two more. <laughs> nah, it's, Actually, go, go, go. it's four, but if I say four, then you probably would kick me off. So that's why <laughs> I, I think that because I think there are one or two questions, so I want to give actually them also time to give you the questions. So okay, fair enough. I I'll speed up. Okay. Okay, that sounds okay. good. Okay. Um, uh, second learning is basically, um, yeah, a lot of people like to just chat in the sense of how are you doing? What's your favorite color? What's your name? What is it? Birthday? fuck you, or whatever comes, really. I mean, people use your chatbot for everything, but not what you made it for, in at least my experience, 80% of the cases. So, um, And this is a really a pity, because if you're a chatbot builder and you want to sell somebody a chatbot system, you you need to take care about the small talk, but you can be sure the customer don't want to pay for that, because they expect your chatbot to be smart. They just want to pay for the functionality you're implementing. So this is really a pity, because if your chatbot is not smart in the sense that they can answer any kind of stupid question, people will feel it's not smart, even if it has great functionality. So this is a big problem people should get in mind or keep in mind. Just really have a decent small talk area so that people kind of feel entertained, sort of. Um, the third is a very interesting one. I think we're missing that greatly. That was something we figured out a couple of years. It's not really only about developers. I mean, yes, developers can integrate APIs and all that. But it really breaks down to the thing you have communication here. You, you talk to people. You want to take a look on how they react and what kind of situations they are. Is it e-commerce? They're just shopping around and looking for something new. Is it first level support? They're really pissed. They want to have they want to have a solution to the problem. So you really actually need people who are not technical guys and not the customer, but somebody in the middle taking care about the communication, designing a dialogue. And I mean, we, we call it the dialogue designers because it's kind of the most straightforward word so that people understand what it is. Um, I would say that should be a person that knows about communication, has psychological um, backgrounds, and yeah, very great communication skills, interviewing skills, and I think um, I'm looking forward. I think that will be a job role in the in the future where you're going to see it on, on job portals, looking, people looking for dialogue designers pretty soon. The last one. Awesome. Um, because this this is really this is really this one Go always this one always gets me when I talk about it. It took me really four years to figure that out. And when I figured it finally out, I felt so stupid because it's so straightforward. And I'm looking forward to what you guys said to it. So um, imagine the following situation. Somebody, we did qualitative testing, people sitting, people chatting with the chatbot. And suddenly, they're, they're, they're looking e-commerce. They're looking for mobile phones, let's assume. And they're doing stuff, doing stuff. And then they're, ah, there is a weird, weird result. I actually wanted to do something else. Can I go back? And I'm like, go back? This is a conversation. What do you mean can, you can go back? I mean, when you talk to a person, would you say, oh, no, 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 sorry. Sorry, let's go back one step. And the person said, Wow, but it's a computer. Usually in a computer you can go back, right? Huh. Well, yes, actually that's true. 
I mean, imagine Word, imagine PowerPoint, imagine Firefox, imagine whatever program you have. There is always a back button, right? You always, whatever you could do, you can go back. And that has a lot to do with trust. The trust in whatever you do as a user, you don't break it. You can always go back. You have the safety of trying out whatever you want, but not getting stuck anywhere. And I think this is something that is very important to have so that people really try it out and don't go away because they're scared that they don't, I don't know, maybe delete the internet or anything. Um, <laughs> And actually, I'm looking forward to having that in, in one or a, maybe even a couple of messenger services because that would be ideal button in the either be Facebook Messenger or Telegram or whatever. Just have that little button in one corner and say, hey, this is not what I wanted. Other expectations or I mistyped it or whatever. Let's go back, try it again. I think that would be a very powerful feature. Last slide. Um, yeah, we released it. It's in better status, so if you want to take a look about it, uh, have uh, talk about it, use it yourself, feel free. It's open source, has a lot of in there. Um, UI is pretty weak at the moment, but we're working on it, and it's going to get better, and yeah, has experience in it for about six years. Thank you very much. Awesome. Big round of applause. Applause, applause, applause. For not only learning, a lot of insight and learnings on top. So that was actually pretty marathon in the back, but you did a great job. And I grasped there's still some questions. Did I get that right? Yeah, I could see your body was like, I want to ask a question in between. Please. Uh, if I understood correctly, you're using MongoDB in the back. Correct. Yeah. So what we figured out, for example, that's especially true for, for chatbots is uh, most of uh, a lot of chatbots are actually some kind of recommendation system or they're learning about the user a lot so if you're thinking a, lo a little bit uh, at the, uh, in the end game you have thousands millions of users and you have to ch share um, save all this data about them so at some point the SQL or MongoDB so document databases are not enough because you need to do short shortest pet algorithms and pet, pet traversal and so on. So you do grab databases. So did you think about it, or like Neo4j or any other implementation, or you left that out to developers and do the extension? And um, once again, I think that really refers to you have some kind of data you want to analyze, might it be big data or whatever, and that would be for me a different system. But when it comes to algorithms, when it comes to dictionaries and stuff that is really calculation-wise, I would really, I mean, I, there's, most of it is implemented into the system. MongoDB is really just a storage for its storing configuration. So it's not really, I mean, it can scale out, but it, it doesn't make huge calculations on it. Everything is made in memory because otherwise it would be just too slow in most of the cases to get decent feedback in time. So if you, if you have it as an external database to make some kind of queries to it to get information out of it, I would definitely recommend looking at graph databases as well. Um, in that case, it suits, suits our needs perfectly. Any more questions? Or, okay, please. Did you, you mentioned earlier about some of the algorithms being too CPU hungry. Did you have any challenges with regards to how many simultaneous conversations in a given server could take? And any tuning with regards to complexity of the algorithm? And Can you repeat the question? Like only yeah, sure. sure. Um, the question was about uh, um, calculating intensive algorithms, and if I have uh, if I have numbers, the problem is when I did really um, this this development at the core at the parts of those algorithms, I was going with a single core CPU, uh, really, and some time ago, and that's what really a hustle per se because this was a struggle with all those algorithms. Nowadays, it's probably better, but honestly speaking, I haven't m made any benchmarks yet from current systems to see how many. I mean, basically, it's a restful system. It's it's scale uh, stateless, at least. The, I mean, there's conversation memory that's not stateless, but the rest is stateless and therefore scales pretty well. Um, but I couldn't give you accurate numbers right now. Cool. Okay, that was a thank you. I think he's satisfied. If there's no more question, we are actually going to close. I, first of all, say thank you again for thank having, uh, for being here, sharing with us, and.